Um, it's remarkable how a song or a scripture verse or um, uh, something else can transport us back to another place, uh, a time and a person. Um, and that song, I think, for many people, is it has that ability. And so I want to pause and give thanks um, for the memories that can cause happy as well as bittersweet tears. And so will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you that your word is alive and well, and we thank you that your word can speak through the gifts of song. And we thank you for the way that you may have transported us back this moment to people we love and who loved you and maybe taught us how to love you in a way. And so, Lord God, for the bitter, we ask for a balm and for a sweet. You would help. We pray that you would help it last. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have this privilege of working part-time at Westminster College, where I get to meet a bunch of college students. And as a pastor, I get to do all the things that the pastor does, the administration side of things and the worship side of things, all the different things. And just as we are studying the chosen study and going deeper with our, our scripture verses here, um, there's a Bible study that I'm a part of there. And shockingly, if you haven't heard, we're studying this spring the gospel of, anybody guess? Matthew. Somebody said it. So we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew, so this isn't by accident that we've been reading the Gospel of Matthew here. And we read this text a little while ago, and one of the young women asked this question. How do we rejoice when the lost start out? I don't think she was trying to push any buttons, but we kind of sat there for a moment. And then someone said, do we? Do we rejoice? And that kind of truth bomb sat in our midst for a little while as we thought about it. And being a good, you know, pastor or leader, I tried to keep my mouth shut and see what other people would say. But my brain immediately went to when I was working with high school students back when I was a physical therapist in, in, um, in Detroit. And I worked with high school students and I remember distinctly the moment when one of my youth decided that she wanted to be baptized. She was taking, she um, did not come from a family that baptized babies, and so she had to make that decision for herself. And so she came forward and said, I want to do this. I want to I do this the rest of my life. I want to be baptized. And I remember the happy tears. I can still see her um, being baptized in front of everyone. I also thought about the girl who had had, had kind of a troubled past and struggled. Um, and we were at a big youth event, and I remember her walking forward for that altar call that sometimes happens. And those happy tears that came to my mind. And I'm sitting in these moments when someone said, you know, I know that I'm practical and I know I'm not Jesus, but I would not leave the 99 to get the one. I think Jesus is crazy to do that. <laughs> And my brain started wandering. And I can't help but think that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, we're supposed to read the Word of God and be challenged as well as blessed. We can't only stick with the words that, that bless us. We have to go deeper. Because I confess my brain, the movie in my mind, went to a different picture. A picture I'm not as proud of. So much so that I confess I did not share it with these young people. <laughs> I was a student pastor when I was in seminary. It's required that you work in a church and get experience. And I was working in one of those big churches that has a program for every age. That silo ministry, we have a children's pastor and a youth pastor and an adult discipleship pastor and then two more pastors, right? And so then I'm the student pastor. We all have a role to play. And I was asked to lead a small group for young adults. For that group of people that might be wandering back to the church, they may or may not be married yet, but they have come back after college, after a first job, maybe because of grad school. But they're not yet into the young family stage of things. And I was asked to cultivate 
a group for that. And then I watched as it grew, right? It grew deep, because sometimes we measure success only by the numbers. It grew deep. People were growing more in love with Jesus. They were growing together as a community. They were learning uh, to sacrifice for God. They were, they were growing in their faith. And we also were gaining slowly. And I confess, the picture in my mind was that group when a couple came to that group. It was a couple that was new to the church and super, super excited to be there. But they had some challenges, and they didn't read social cues, and they were actually closer to my parents' age, but the church didn't know what to do with them, and they cognitively probably should have been children in youth ministry, but that because of child protection rules, they decided to put them in our group. And I tried outwardly, not the best that I could, to be gracious, but they made the group dynamic harder. And as much as I outwardly welcomed them, I confess it's not the proudest moment of what my heart was thinking. The lost were being found and they were so excited for Jesus. And I was just mad at my bosses for making my job harder. Real great in the church, right? And I thought about how in, when the Gospel of Luke tells the story of the the lost sheep, they go on to tell the story of the lost son. The lost son is also known as the prodigal son. There are two brothers, and one says to his dad, I wish you were dead, can I have my inheritance now? And he goes off to find his fortune. And the older brother is the good, faithful 99 that stays behind and keeps the herds and plants the fields. After a time, the family hits the land, and the younger brother comes home, starving to death, asking, groveling for forgiveness. And the father kills the, the prized calf for the one who had been lost. And the older brother says, I've been here the whole time, and you did none of that for me. And I thought about the question, how do we rejoice when the lost are found? That question that that teenage girl posed to the group that made me a little uncomfortable. Because I think that when we read this story, we see the picture, maybe in our childhood Bible, of Jesus with a lamb around his shoulders. That beautiful picture of the shepherd Jesus coming to our rescue. We sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I used a more modern song for our prayer of confession, The Reckless Love of God. There's this song, I, I dare you to look it up on YouTube when you leave. The Reckless Love of God that leaves the 99, we sing. It couldn't, um, it chases me down. But when we hear that, we see ourselves as the sheep. And that is true. That is absolutely true. We are the lost one. But I think the other side of the gospel is that this is also radical. I want you to picture for a second the crowd Jesus was with when he was telling this story. So imagine Jesus is here in the United States. Because we Christians sometimes mistakenly think that we are um, in the promised land here in the U.S. And imagine in this crowd around Jesus, we've got some, some politicians that are really powerful and good and influential. Maybe imagine your favorite president. For some of you, that might be Barack Obama, and some of you, that might be Ronald Reagan. Some, like, think of your favorite president sitting with Jesus. Think about some really great TV preachers. Maybe it's Billy Graham, maybe it's Joel Osteen, maybe it's someone else, the guy at Crystal Cathedral. Really powerful, influential people. Maybe there's some people at the table like, they might have a last name of Rockefeller, or Carnegie, or maybe Bezos, or Musk. And they're around the table, and they're talking to Jesus, and they say, who's the greatest in this kingdom we have established here? And Jesus leaves. And he goes and gets the latchkey kid. The kid who is a little too young to be home alone. 
who has uh, ripped pair of jeans and some blood because he's been out riding his bike. And maybe there's some dirt behind his ears because there's nobody really to tell him he needs to take a bath. And so he's a little bit dirtier than we good church people would like. Maybe he has a little bit of snot in his nose because he's in public school and that's a petri dish and no one's there to wipe his nose. And Jesus takes that kid, puts him on his lap, and says to the great minds and leaders of our world, be like him. You see, this is really radical stuff. We love the picture of the, of the child in my children's Bible. My kid, the kids around Jesus look like my kids. Blonde hair, blue eyed, clean, cut, no dirt to be found. But children were not valued in that culture. And Jesus takes the marginalized and brings them to the center of power, the religious authority of the day. It says, be like this. And he goes so far to say, if you, it would be better for you to be drowned in the uh, Cape off of Washington, D.C. than to let this child stumble. That's radical stuff. So then we find that story of Jesus leaving the 99, and if we're honest, if we put aside the picture that we have from our childhood Bible of Jesus carrying us, we might be more like my student who said, I'm not sure Jesus was very smart, not very practical, leaving the 99 to get that one. Recently, I found myself watching the movie Jesus Revolution. It was popular a year or two ago. It's on Netflix. I wonder who, has anyone seen it? Okay. So Jesus Revolution has only one big name, has Kelsey Grammer. So if you were a child of the 80s and 90s or you had children in the 80s and 90s, you might have watched Cheers or Frasier. That's what he's known for. Or X-Men. Or X-Men? Okay, or X-Men. <laughs> this is why we don't. Um, for you my sermon before we start. Um, <laughs> um, and Kelsey Grammer plays the true story of a man named Chuck, who is a pastor of a small church that's struggling to get by in the middle of the hippie movement. And his daughter is rebelling, not yet a hippie, but he doesn't understand this movement of people. And these kids who are experimenting with drugs and refusing to dress like a normal person and refusing to wear shoes, and he literally, near the beginning of the movie, says, if I met a hippie, I want to talk to him. And a teenage daughter brings home a hippie to talk to her dad. And it turns out this young man was someone who had chased after all the things of the world, trying to numb his pain and find truth through LSD and other substances, and found that it didn't work. And somehow in the midst of it, Jesus found him. Because we're going to say that we don't find Jesus, Jesus finds us. Jesus finds him, and he becomes a preacher, and he starts telling other hippies the love of Jesus. So he sits in this pastor, in this good, proper, you know, American dream pastor with the home and the car and the kid and all the things, and sits in his kitchen and talks to him about God's love. And what's remarkable about this is that the pastor is the humility and the curiosity to listen to this young man, and even it not only invites him into his church, but gives him a platform, which we don't always do to the marginalized in our midst. And there's a movement. And near the beginning, because this isn't a spoiler, I think it's even in the trailer, in, near the beginning of the movie, there are a small group of hippies in one side. And all the good church people are on the other side. And the pastor says this radical thing. He says, you are welcome here. The door is always open for you. And if anyone has a problem with that, the door goes the other way. And literally you watch a couple, probably a couple, that that pastor cares deeply for. Get up and walk out. 
And then you see an older gentleman get up, and he has this impassive look on his face. And he looks at the back door where probably his good friends, good church people, just left. And he walks across the aisle and he sits down with the hippies and says, Preacher, we're ready to start. I want us, as we think about this passage, to understand that that reckless love of God is for us. I doubt. But I also want us to understand that that reckless love of God is to the marginalized in our culture. Whatever that marginalized people might be. It might be people that look differently than us, or speak differently, or dress differently, vote differently. It might be people that think different things about God that push our buttons. And that reckless love of God is also those people, for those people. It's for that couple that came in wanting to love God and grow deeper, and I was just not my best self. Because I think the reason this is such a radical text and why it bugs the people of Jesus' day, and if we take it seriously, bugs us. Because inviting people who look differently, when they are the lost are found, they don't turn into us. That was the problem with the hippies. They didn't become good, tie-wearing, Christian, Protestant Americans. They continued coming to church, loving Jesus, barefoot, long hair, all the things the church at that time was trying to stand against. Because our call is to not conform people to look like us, but to call people into deeper relationship to Jesus. And so, how do we take this reckless love of God seriously for ourselves? And for maybe those that you and I have not given our best selves to. Will you pray with me? Holy God, it's been more than 15 years, but I pray for that couple who loved you and your church, who were the epitome of the lost sheep being found. And because they made things a little less neat and tied up with a bow, they did not receive the best of us and our church. Lord God, we pray for the marginalized in our midst. The people that come to mind that we are ashamed to speak out loud. We pray that we would not only receive your reckless love, but that we would be able to embody that reckless love to the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our shepherd and our savior. Amen. Mm -hmm.